Are there successful ways to lift humanity out of poverty while simultaneously lowering our ecological footprint? For the past five years in 25 different countries and on five different continents, I've explored this grand but really elegantly simple question. So before I share with you what I know to be the answer, I'd like to explore with you why this is such a critical question for all of us to address. We are awakening to our singularity here in our one and only home. She's a beauty. There she is. There we are right now. We're hurling through space and time. Just this incredible place, but you know, what's going on here today? What's the story on planet Earth? Well, to use the words of a Pulitzer Prize winning author, the state of the planet is hot, flat, and crowded. While there's indeed just one Earth, there are more and more of us arriving every day. I mean, consider this. That's three beats, or actually three people per second, that are being added to human population. So by the time my talk is done, another 2,000 people will have arrived here on planet Earth. Wow. And in the last few months, we hit this major milestone in population, 7 billion people. Now, I don't know about you, but 7 billion is hard for me to really imagine. But try this on. If we all took a hike together and we walked around the equator of the planet and we took 7 billion steps, we'd go around the planet over 100 times. If we stacked 7 billion average-sized people on top of each other, they'd go to the moon and back over a dozen times. So more and more people are arriving. We've got 7 billion people today, and we look to the future, we see by the end of the century, 9 or 10 billion people. I look at this graph, and I think that's theoretical, but it's not. So where are all these people? Well, on this map, they're represented by dots, where each dot is 2 million people. So if you take a look, this map looks a little weird, but it's weird only because you're actually now seeing where everybody is on the planet. And it's understandable that environmental scientists such as myself are very interested in the ecological impacts of you know, North America and Europe and certain parts of Asia. But when we look at the major population centers, we really better be focused there as well. Latin America, Africa, Asia, that's where the vast majority are of the people today. And while it's impossible to generalize about any part of the planet, it is fair to say that for many people in many countries in these population centers, they're emerging, right? They're trying to get up out of poverty. They're trying to grow, they're trying to move forward. So the next question is, what's their sustainability questions all about? And in this case, really, for many people in these countries, it's about survival, just day-to-day -day survival, just getting by. Our questions about what's the greenest light bulb or the most fuel efficient vehicle or anything like that, it's will I have access to clean water to drink today? Or will the water I drink make me sick? Do I have access to food or fuel to cook my food? Basic questions about human rights. So for billions of people today, questions of sustainability are about survival especially for women and children. It's all pretty overwhelming, but you know what? That's only half the problem. The other half is our ecological footprint. I think of ecological footprint like a biological bathroom scale. You know, it measures how much weight, how much impact we have on the planet. So it looks specifically at the biologically productive land and water that it takes to meet our inputs such as food or fuel or water, energy, and also process our outputs, such as human waste or solid waste or carbon dioxide. So it measures all of this to see what are your needs in terms of inputs or outputs, and then calculates that in terms of a physical space. How many hectares? So let's take a look now at the average ecological footprint here on planet Earth. It's about 2.6 hectares, or about the size of maybe five or six football fields. Now let's take a look 
at the typical footprint of someone living in the United States or some other highly developed nations of the world. And you can see on a per capita basis, they're a whole lot bigger. But remember, this is not where the dominant populations are on planet Earth today. And if we take a look at their ecological footprints, we see that they're actually much smaller, at least at the moment. The future size of their ecological footprints may be the biggest, most important question facing all of us. And just to add a little insult to injury, we're already in ecological debt. Because according to the World Wildlife Fund, sometime back in the 70s, we actually exceeded the biocapacity of our planet. We're no longer living with what nature can provide in terms of sort of interest, but instead we're mining a one-time gift of natural capital. That's not a good thing. It tears away at the fabric of life that supports everyone. It makes it more difficult for people who are trying to emerge from poverty to get up and out. It creates concerns about scarcity in our world, which can often lead to just more tension. And it takes away development rights from future generations. So let's summarize all of this. We've got billions of people that legitimately need to take a huge step out of poverty, out of impoverished economic conditions, and also impoverished ecological conditions. Meanwhile, we've already got a collective ecological footprint that's bigger than one planet. So we're really facing two mega challenges. One, humanitarian, and the other, ecological. Whew. All of this can be pretty daunting. Right? You could just be shocked and overwhelmed by it all. You could be anxious, depressed, angry. We could argue about which of these sets of problems should we solve first. Or we could focus on the simultaneous solving of both of these problems, especially where they're most acute. And so I've been spending a lot of time looking around for new models, new projects, new programs, what I'm calling ecological handprints. And so what I'd like to do is share with you a few incredible examples that I've discovered around the world. Let's start with energy. Now, energy poverty is a big deal around the world. A third of humanity doesn't have access to the modern energy services that most of us would take for granted. I'm talking about some basic stuff here, like access to electricity, fuel to cook your food, you know, clean water. Just stop and focus on electricity for a moment. Four times the population of the United States lives today without access to electricity. And when we look to the decades ahead, we know that half of those folks will probably never be wired. And the other half could be waiting decades for electricity to arrive to their homes or villages. So tonight, instead of flipping the switch to turn on the light, kerosene lanterns are lit. And unfortunately, with the lighting of kerosene lanterns comes a host of negative consequences. Tight correlations between the fumes from kerosene lamps and lots of respiratory diseases. Also highly correlated with cancers and cataracts and low birth rates. Women and children who breathe the fumes from kerosene lanterns inhale the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes a day. Not good. But there is an alternative, an ecological handprints alternative called the Solar Sisters. The Solar Sisters are this amazing group. It's a peer-to-peer, woman-to-woman network of social entrepreneurs. And they are spreading a new idea. It's solar-powered, LED-lit lanterns. And they're just getting started, but already they've sold and distributed 17,000 of these lanterns all over Sub-Saharan Africa. So tonight, in this dry goods store, instead of soot and fumes and flames, they have clean, healthy, long-lasting light. Fabulous. Well, here's another example from Asia, where they're solarizing Bangladesh. This program is known as Grameen Shakti. Grameen meaning village, Shakti meaning empowerment or force. Right? And 
What's so great about Grameen Shakti is they've come up with a financial model that really works. So folks don't pay up front for their solar system. It's installed, and they start benefiting right away. But instead, they make monthly payments. And here's the cool thing. Their monthly payments end up actually being less than what they are previously paying for kerosene. So clean, healthy light, that's affordable. Great for the end user. But here's another great outcome of this project. Jobs. Lots of jobs for women who build these solar systems, install them, market them, and service them. Fantastic. It's an ecological handprint employment project as well. Or how about the boy who harnessed the wind? This is a 14-year-old Malawian inventor and now author who came up with a design for a wind generator. The wind generator is made up of beat-up bicycle parts and scrap that he got from a junkyard and the blue gum trees that grow around his local village. So now it's supplying electricity to his home and powering some appliances. And the local villagers got so excited, they said, hey, come on, build some more. And he did. And most recently, he's put together a solar-powered water pumping system that's delivering the first clean drinking water to his village. Wow. How great is that? These ecological handprint stories from all over the world are in all areas. It's true about electricity. It can be true about water. It's also true about food. Let's talk just for a minute about the cooking of food. You know, cooking over an open flame might look romantic and innocent, but it's not. There are three times more people killed by open flame cooking than are killed by malaria. So huge health problems, but also ecological problems because the fuel wood for all these stoves has to be gathered, right? So there are impacts on local forests. And one of the main problems with all of this is that in many cultures of the world, women are responsible for gathering firewood. And so they have to go sometimes great distances and often into very dangerous areas. Once again, there's an alternative. In this case, it's the Darfur Stove Project. This group got together, it designed, and then distributed now over 20,000 of these new fuel-efficient stoves. They use half as much wood. So now refugee women have to spend less money for fuel, but perhaps more importantly, far less time in remote, dangerous locales. So what's happening in Darfur is happening in other places around the world as well. Take, in this case, Ghana. West African entrepreneurs, because ecological handprints often really support that entrepreneurial spirit. So these guys came up with a new charcoal stove design. It uses a third less charcoal, it cooks faster, it cooks cleaner, and it's super affordable. Folks can actually pay off the cost of the new stove with fuel savings from just a few months. So great for both the economy and for the ecology. Or how about in Guatemala, where a healthcare charity was concerned both about toxic fumes inside and loss of biodiversity outside. And so they came up with a regionally specific stove design and they came up with a manufacturing and distribution system to support these stoves. So it really became like a, a local economic development project. So now we've got 100,000 of these stoves sold as kits all over Latin America, Guatemala, Mexico, and beyond. These stove projects are so exciting for me because they address a lot of issues. They address health, they address gender equity issues, and they also address the problems of loss of biodiversity and deforestation. You know, deforestation is often most acute in the poorest nations around the world. Take, for example, Kenya. The loss of biodiversity is pretty obvious from this photo here, but what you don't really see here is the water scarcity and, and the soil erosion and the other related impacts. But once again, there's another model out there an ecological handprints model. In this case, it's a group of women that said, enough! And they got together and started a tree planting program. First, they started their nurseries where they grew, and then ultimately they planted millions and millions and millions of trees all over Kenya. They're bringing back their local forest cover, they're bringing back ecosystem services, and they're bringing back hope. 
And they're empowered by this process. They're becoming champions for sustainability. They're teaching their children how to do this so it carries on to future generations. They're, they're growing a local market. They're building their economy. They're becoming more involved in local politics as well. And they're reconnecting with the earth that we all share. I'm so thrilled, delighted, to be able to share with you these inspirational stories of hope and change. It's a challenging world out there, but these ecological handprints, they keep me going. I, they didn't get angry, they didn't get frustrated, they got busy, and they used their hands to create new models, new programs that are both helping humanity and helping the home that we all share. So my passion these days is sharing these stories, promoting these handprints, this approach, so important. And I hope you'll join me. So you know, hop on the web, find an ecological handprint that really resonates with your passion and help lift it up. Or look around your community. Maybe there's a project or a program there that's doing this kind of work and you can support it directly. I don't know if you don't find one, well then maybe you should go create one. Ecological handprints represent the best in human aspiration and achievement. They teach us all how to move forward together, right? embracing human dignity and embracing biological resilience, both lifting humanity and lowering our footprint.